Now this is very controversial and I would never have used this slide before, but I can now. <laughs> um, this is the view from my house. I, I, I live in City Beach and lived there for a number of years. And I anguish each autumn and I anguish during winter and spring when I have to put up with those sunsets. They are a new threat that's pervading our landscape. It's easy for ministers to give this was something in June 2015, $20 million to a traditional burning program. I always say to people who come, I said, wow, what a wonderful sunset. I said, no, that's our biodiversity sitting up there. Why is this a bad thing? I don't think in evolutionary history we have ever had winter and spring fires that, this, that our ecology and our species have adapted to. It's fundamentally logical to any thinking human that you don't go into an English bluebell woodland during bluebell season and chop it all down because you say when it dries off it's all going to be dangerous. But we do it in our bushlands everywhere and it seems to pervade the psyche. Sure, protecting of people and asset is paramount and important, but this I think is an unforgivable travesty that again is a careless disregard for the sensitivities of the ecology of this state. And I'll, I, I put it up to remind us all, whenever you see that smudgy sunset, think of the plants and the animals that are up in that smoke. And I think it's time we start taking stock. I can see papers in 50 years time being written about this time, about what we did to these landscapes e.g. prescribed burning at the wrong times of the year that have led to localised extinctions. And why is this, uh, uh, why do I speak with a bit of authority? Well, I'm going to give you an example from King's Park. That was 1939, the distribution of belt grass. Been introduced much earlier. That's it in 1987. The size of this hole show you how much there was. Why did it happen? Because between that period and that period, they started to burn. Mm. And they were burning on rotations of three years. They were all spring ignitions. Now, Velcras is just an indicator. We used it as a map, a surrogate of mismanagement. And we, in fact, converted what was at that stage, because we've got the detailed transect from 1939. An ecologist called Alison Baird mapped big transects. We found them in the archives, and we were able to go back to her transects, which were over in this part of the park, and retrace her steps almost to within the yard, because she used yards on the measures. And so we know, and she wrote from 1930, from 1939, we then did 60 years on in 1999, we reassessed that bushland um, to find what had changed. Now, sure, belt grass had changed, and that was the work that um, was great work that Bob Dixon did to discover the selective control of belt grass. But what we discovered from 1939 to this point here is that there's a whole lot of species, native species, have gone missing. Now, it wasn't the belt grass. Belt grass was a symptom of the burning patterns, but it was the scale of the burning, the frequency of the burning, and the timing of the burning that took away all of the fire-sensitive ericas. So these are all the leucopogons, um, uh, some of the cedar astrolomas. Um, Many, all of the non-re-sprouting herbertias went. We lost our hybanthus from that part of the park as well. All of those sort of things went. And we knew they'd gone because she recorded some of those, but also our reference communities that we've started to use had all those species. And we know we can link that directly to the impact of prescribed burning. So a careless action like that has permanently altered the face of Kings Park. We're now doing a big study on native bees who depend upon those species, and we're going to be comparing this remnant to intact remnants to see, because native bees depend upon those species for their nectar resources, to see whether what happened in this trajectory here actually has led to the decline of those native bee communities. And my guess is probably they have, because native bees use different resources at different times. Now also that level of carelessness can mean you get other consequences. Alison Baird, um, back in uh, by the late 50s, 
wrote a paper about the impact of burning increasing the abundance of Alicajarina in Kings Park bushland. And this is the 2009-10 drought season. Um, again, I'm not a public servant. I wasn't allowed to show that image up until now. Um, uh, the minister said this is, uh, uh, what was the words, uh, an unnecessary, um, uh, an unnecessary situation, and we'll move on from that. Um, and this is Alicajarina fraseriana, massive death. You can see already that we've lost some of the bigger, th so this was a large jarrah, long gone from that system, uh, just a stag sitting there. But that system had been lurched into a particular carrying capacity of Alicajarina because of the high fire frequency. So Cajarina is a seed producing species and a re-sprouter, so it goes into an abundance cycle with high fire frequencies. Not all species with those attributes do it, but this is one of them. And its carrying capacity was far in excess of what that bushland could carry for the water availability, particularly when you started moving into climate changing scenarios. And as a result, we just got this radical collapse in the canopy. It also, because of that high carrying capacity, it of course was smothering out a range of other species. And we know Jarrah, we know our Marys, but importantly, our four key banks here, which are Menzizii, Attenuata, um, Grandis, were in decline, with Grandis, the next species to go, and Alyssifolia down to the last two specimens in that bushland. Mm -hmm. And yet we know from 1939 that Alyssifolia was all over the southwest portion of the park. Gosh, careless management has had major consequences on this great high This is why we are yep. following the traditional yep, yep, yep. Aboriginal way of managing the land. Yep. All I say to them is, this is a friggin' great continent. For you to have evolved a flora adapted to Aboriginal burning patterns in the last 80,000 years on a continental scale, when Deepal, with their own air wing and all those incendiaries, can't even burn the whole place, then I do question whether you can physically do it. And indeed, I think what we've done is we've misread what these landscapes were like. We've looked, for example, at that Ensign Dale at 1834 image. If you have a look, there's smoke in the distance. That has been quoted by Sylvia Hallam in her book, uh, Fire and Hearth. Great little book, but she talks about that early settlers noted fire was used across these landscapes. Well, no, fire was probably put in the spot there and the spot there. And I remember uh, the great retraction of the famous Belga study. Did you, you know the one where they aged fire frequencies? It was a fascinating retraction because I remember being at the conference which was over at um, um, Ascot Racecourse <coughs> and um, Byron Lamont had stood up and he, um, the people and they said oh we found these fire scars up these Xantha Rears and they kept going and kept going and then you know Europeans um, arrived and then we had uh, an influenza outbreak and Aboriginals were dying and, and look the, the, the gaps increased between there. This shows that the whole forest was you know, being burned on these very regular fire frequencies, and we all thought, well, gosh, this is amazing. Until a Noongar stood up and he said, you know, you need to consider the fact that we actually used to burn individual xanthoria, or then you call them blackboards. We used to burn them individually to get the resin from them. We didn't burn the whole forest. You need to take that into consideration. And sure enough, when they went back and started sampling more broadly and not picking all the big ones, they found in fact there was no correlation in the fire scale pattern. So we've misread the landscapes. We've got partial English records, we've got paintings, we've got some of the science that's done, and then we've got people like Tim Flannery who is taking some simple notions, um, you know, his future leaders and a few of these things, takes simple notions and then says, oh, and then they just, he paints them across an entire continental landscape. That is an extraordinarily long stretch and not scientifically valid. Nonsense. Yeah. And one of our highly cited uh, reviews that we've written, and it's wonderfully controversial, um, came out in um, Trends in Plant Science, which is a great journal. We actually challenge the whole concept of fire adaptation. What we said is, Australian plants show resilience to fire, they're not necessarily adapted to fire. So 
we are resilient to getting the common cold. We're not adapted to resist the common cold. It's a very, it's subtle, but fundamentally drives different concepts. So a biodiversity burn is about the fact they're adapted to fire, therefore they need the fire. Mm -hmm. Very mixed, that's, that's a very uh, long extension of some very fragile facts. Now sure, there are fire stimulated flowering plants in our flora, I worked on them, we found it was ethylene from the fire. We know smoke stimulates germination, you say, wow, what's he talking about? That's clear adaptation. No, we think those traits actually came from disturbance phenomena in pre-burnt landscapes, where disturbance of soil creates an ethylene pulse, it also releases the smoke-like chemical. And it's called an exaptation, <coughs> not an adaptation. That is something that is adapted today or resilient today, but based on a trait that came from other forces within the system. Phyllis Robertson, um, I don't know if you've heard her speak yeah. about fire, um, you know, and she traces back to Aboriginal, you know, because of her connection, she's part of Aboriginal. Um, she's always maintained that the landscape here wasn't burnt. Sorry. No, the, num the, the numbers were, yeah. were insufficient to husband the landscape on such a scale to alter the landscape. And we're now seeing um, ecofire and those patterns through northern Australia where we're urging a little bit of caution over annual fire frequencies. And um, some of the Kimberley work that we did where we were ageing some of the cypress trees up there which are highly fire sensitive but an important tree to pastures because that's what they make their strainer posts from. Only thing that termites up there won't eat. Ultra fire sensitive, we find lots of big dead ones and no new recruits because of the high fire frequencies going through some of the sandstone areas, which are the last stands of Calitris intratropica in the Kimberley. We're saying this is a contemporary phenomenon. Clearly this is not a, a traditional practice because we would have never had big Calitris in these environments. So we're, we're in a really interesting journey now because, of course, there's the science, there's the social dimension, there's the politics, and then there's the business mm -hmm. of this. And you get that all mixed up together, <coughs> put a big dose of risk over the top of it, and fear button down the bottom, and it's a diabolical combination. And I just hope that good sense prevails because ultimately, as we did in King's Park, we will roll that out across the rest of these landscapes if we continue to be careless in the use of things like fire. Um, the Urban Bushland Council has always maintained um, that we um, don't advocate prescribed burning on the Swan Coastal Plain. We've always said that. Mm. Um, and the two, there are two problems we've got. Arson and grassy weeds. Yeah. Build grass and, and grassy weeds are actually worse after fires. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, in my place in Maroona, I sit on the Hills Residents Fire Group. We had our little meeting on Sunday, which is always a great challenge because I'm sitting in a great group of 60 farmers, <laughs> um, and I they don't know really who I am. It's best kept that way. But um, <laughs> you really have to watch your P's and Q's because the first thing was, well, when are we going to start burning all the verges? And I quietly pointed out only if you're going to then do your follow-up weed control because you will turn them into more flammable verges yep. Yep. instantly. Yep. I didn't right. bother going down and you'll destroy the orchids and the lesion altias <laughs> and everything else that everybody drives up Nangabrook Road to enjoy. You'll destroy those. That's not the debate. You can't do it. Just say you're going to create a bigger fire hazard, get your weed control program. They go, oh, oh really, is that what happens? And yeah, that's exactly what happens. So it's a, it's a few more quick questions.